conversation with Tim Oditucci. Let's talk about business and lifestyle. All right, welcome everybody again. It's me, Tim, here. Welcome to Conversations with Tim Oditucci. I am excited today to have Jen Donadin joining me today. She's the president and CEO of Ivana. I'm sure you have you have all the companies that you deal with as well, but that's how I know you. So that's I'm gonna that's how I'm gonna introduce you. But uh, you know, just to kind of give a little background to the audience here, uh, your company is the tenth fastest growing uh, company in the country right now. Uh, you are top 40 under, under 40 award for construction in the country, future 40 under 40 in the province. It seems that you are just killing it right now. How are you doing? Welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem I'm, at all. Yeah, I'm doing well. Very busy, uh, but really good. Yeah. That's good. Well, I mean, with everything you do, I have no doubt that you're very busy. So I'm happy you were able to take some time to have a conversation with me today. So, you know what, let's get right into it. So how did this all come together? How did you build such a powerhouse name in the real estate business in the country? What is your secret to success? So I, uh, it's not as glamorous of a story as many entrepreneurs get to have. Uh, I would say Avana was created out of necessity. I, uh, previously to being an entrepreneur was, I worked uh, as a financial advisor in the banking industry. And when I was on my first mat leave, I got pregnant with my second child. And uh, yeah, I just looked at my life and all the traveling that was required for, for my job, for my career, the 60 hour weeks. I looked at my baby and I knew I had another baby on the way. At the time, my husband was a firefighter and I just knew I couldn't do it all well. And I'm a big believer, if you're going to do something, do it well. That's true. Do it all well, you know, make a change. And so when I thought about what change I could make, <laughs> my career was kind of the option, I guess I went with to, to do that. So that's okay. kind of where the idea of looking uh, for entrepreneurship originally came from. And, you know, really from there, uh, I, I, I didn't originally have a, a passion, we'll say for real estate. Again, it was out of kind of necessity, but over the years, I've really grown to have a strong passion for real estate, for housing, for the community. And uh, over the years, yeah, it's become quite, quite the uh, little venture that's turned into <laughs> a, a, a big venture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely a big venture because everywhere I go, I see Ivana, Ivana Homes popping up everywhere. Are you mainly just in the province here or are you in other parts as well? So we uh, we are headquartered in Regina. We yeah. had most of our expansion in Regina. We've recently expanded to Edmonton. So we have our first project there under construction. We'll have probably about just under 500 units, rental units in Edmonton by the end of next year, uh, which is significant growth because by the end of next year in Regina, we'll probably have around... 800 units. So we're kind of expanding in like one and a half years in Edmonton as quickly as we've done in eight years here. Um, and then we're also looking in BC and Ontario right now. So we basically are just taking, you know, I feel like over the last, well, it's actually our seven year birthday tomorrow for a well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> but I think that we've really spent the last seven years figuring out our industry our competitive advantage, finding our niche, finding innovation, finding the difference that we could be within a very established industry. And we've really got a really great recipe that works. And so um, replicating it is what we're looking to do and uh, diversify geographically now. That's amazing. You know, would you say that, um, you know, the processes and recipe that you've created, would you say that other people maybe not even in the real estate business, but other entrepreneurs in other businesses, is that kind of their key to success too, is to look at those recipes and processes and find efficiencies and things like that. Absolutely, yeah. I think in any industry, you know, if you come into an industry and you're just going to operate like every other business, you're just gonna be like every other business. You know, mm -hmm. you're gonna grow at the same pace of every other business. And when we came into our industry, I mean, this is, I talk often about how our, we have a very, you know, construction and real estate is a very male dominated industry. Mm -hmm. 
And for a long time, that was a disadvantage to me because I had a hard time kind of gaining the respect that I needed to, to really operate and grow my business. But over time, I realized that I'm actually at such an advantage and Avana's at an advantage that we are female led. All four owners of Avana, like when we started, we we're all under 30. Mm-hmm. And so we came in with just such a different way of thinking and doing things. And it ended up being a huge benefit to us. And so every year that went by, we really took a client centric, uh, focus and we're the highest rated property management company in the city and we plan to replicate that in each city (laughs) that we move to and uh yeah I think for any business having uh that again competitive advantage really focusing on your customer and you know focusing on the processes the foundation before you scale is just really crucial that is true you touched on something that I kind of want to go back to you mentioned that when you started uh, you were under 30 when you started and all the owners were under 30 when you started. How did you get through the fear of kind of going in, both feet in and building this business? Because I find that like a lot of people that are younger, they, there is that fear there of failure or that fear that I don't know enough to do it. Uh, and they just never do it. And a lot of people end up getting into it at a much la- later age. How did you guys overcome that fear or that obstacle of being a young person that is starting this business? Honestly, if I could sum it down to one word, it's belief. And I always say, if you don't believe in yourself, nobody's going to believe in you. So for me, I'm the one that came up with the idea of our company. If I didn't believe in myself, I would have never convinced my husband to do it with me or my brother or my sister-in-law. I would have never convinced the banks to lend us money. And I, I just always, since I was like a little girl believed that you can do anything that you believe you can do and anything you set your mind to, I've always been a bit of an overachiever. And so I think that's (laughs) because, you know, I just don't really believe in failure. Do we make mistakes and do we get it on the first try? Always, absolutely not. But I view uh, in business, especially mistakes and even the odd loss here, there is tuition and you don't really fail until you quit. And so uh, even though I was young, I mean, I've, I've had that same kind of belief feeling since I was, again, a little girl. And I think like I was raised in, you know, just like a normal kind of family, but I didn't, I didn't have a safety net. I wasn't mm-hmm. given any success. I didn't have parents that could lend me money for us to start our business. Like it was, I needed to make something out of my life or nobody was going to for me. So I think I just took the confidence from, you know, that and what I had previously done in my life. And what's the worst that can happen? Like, really? That's true. That's true. (laughs) You know, I find that I find that a lot of people, maybe what is lacking is that belief, right? Uh, Or that faith or the resilience as well. Because you said one thing that, you know, you never fail until you quit. And I think that takes resilience and that takes passion, right? So so, and I think that that's probably what a lot of people are lacking because there's so many people that start and then they give up once the first process doesn't work instead of morphing that process to see if the next version of it will work until they find the recipe that is perfect for them. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned something earlier about, uh, you know, using your advantage as a woman in business uh, to kind of work for you. Uh, what are the type of challenges did you face uh, being a woman in business? I mean, in the beginning years, there was, you know, a lot of them. We had, we had to go through like every contact list for certain trades just to get a trade to even call us back or once they did meet us and, you know, find out that we're going to be a female-led company in construction. And I was like a 25-year-old blonde girl. They literally like laughed at me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in the beginning, it was just like even finding the trades. I was very fortunate that um, I came from a finance background because I was able to use my connections from the bank to help on the finance side. But once we grew to a certain size, we were kind of forced to go to the commercial banking side of things. And I had no idea what the commercial banking industry was like in this city. It is very male dominated. It is. Like the last statistic I think I read was that like a female entrepreneur will be declined 
I don't know, like 300% more than a male entrepreneur. Wow. (laughs) So that was, that was, you know, that could have really without, again, probably my background and knowing how to kind of navigate the financing system and go outside of the, of the province. We, we, we probably would have had our growth halted significantly. We found fantastic commercial banking uh, connections with some, some credit unions kind of like outside of Regina, which I found very mm-hmm. interesting. So like a Plainsview credit union would be an example, but they were smaller. So their, you know, max aggregate was so much lower than what we really needed to scale to the level that we wanted to. Um, so yeah, it was just like getting, I, st- I actually still deal with it. Like there's still certain meetings that I have to go to where I'll take my husband just because I find it you start more at like ground zero if there's a male with me rather than like minus 10, which I yeah. still find to be ridiculous, but it is what it is. You have to play the game. Um, <laughs> but yeah, over the years then, what I found is, you know, I'd, I had a, a leader from the construction industry in Regina tell me once that when you want to know where Ivana is, you just look and see where everybody else is operating and you just like look the complete opposite way and that's where you find Ivana. And he was almost like making fun of me, but I was like, no, this is perfect. Like, you this think I'll send a box. Yeah, we, 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 I don't want to do what every other company from Saskatchewan has. This is why, you know, we're 10th fastest growing company in, in Canada for the first time a female led business from Saskatchewan has done that. And so it actually was perfect because I don't want to do what somebody else has already done. And so if we are kind of an anomaly or overdoing our own thing, that's perfect for us. Um, and so that's why I think the competitive advantage piece comes in, in that, again, many people in our industry, like if you think real estate investor, especially of a larger company, like what demographic do you think of? Like older white men. Older, yeah, you know? that's true. Right. Yeah. And I found even as a renter, uh, when I was younger, there's just like almost this arrogance in the industry. They, they're, you know, lots of times they're wealthy and they- yeah. You're almost like doing them a favor by giving you a place to, to live. And you know, I don't know, they've got tans from their 14 homes anyways. <laughs> and so when we came in and again, I came from the banking world where client service and the relationships you have with your clients is so important. And so we applied a lot of what I learned um, from, from being in the bank to our business, very client centric. Our, our residents are like our family, our employees are like our family. And it's worked out so well for us because we have like this year, I think our retention ratio is 85%. So of wow. 500 leases uh, expiring in a year, we're only losing 15%. And many times it's because, you know, they're leaving Regina or their situation has changed, but uh, yeah, it's, it's worked out really, really well for us now. That's, that's good. Cause I mean, the one thing that you touched on, even though you didn't use those exact words, it's it's the culture of the company, right? If you build a good culture, people are going to see it and people are going to want to be around you. But I, I think I think one big key takeaway from what you just said, though, is, uh, you know, looking at taking what people see as a disadvantage and turn it into an advantage and working outside the box than that everybody else is working in, right? Because when you work in the same box as everybody else, it's just too crowded. Of course. Right? Too crowded and your growth will not be as much. But if you're not in the same space as they are, you can grow as much as they want. And by the time they realize it, you're already up there, right? So, so that's really, really amazing. How do you find, though, that being an entrepreneur and managing family life, how does that affect things for you? I mean, that's probably one of the biggest challenges. Um I found in, in being a scaling company and having myself as our CEO, the reason I left my career, which I absolutely loved, like I'm like obsessed with the economy and numbers. I'm like really yeah. just like a nerd deep down inside. Um, and so the numbers grow. Oh yeah. Like spreadsheets and headphones. And it's <laughs> like, yeah, seriously. Nice. <laughs> Um, I always use the nerdy emoji when I'm texting my business partners, which is also happens to be my family. It's like my emoji. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, I would say, so the reason I left my career, which I loved was because I wanted to be a very present hands-on mom. 
I, you know, I know that time goes fast and I didn't have the most stable childhood. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to give my kids a fantastic life. And I knew I couldn't do that if I wasn't around. So as we grew and I found myself, you know, under a lot of pressure and Avana needed me, my kids needed me. Uh, that's probably the biggest, I guess, complicating factor we've had, but I've always worked from home. Um, and so that has really helped my mom when we started our business early retired and moved out to, um, where we live right next door. And so she's always been a really great support so that when we can't be with the kids, me and my husband, it's my mom who's yeah. there with them. So they've never been in full-time daycare and it's just crazy. Like I, I just work and, and be a mom all the time. And, uh, people I think think I'm crazy sometimes and I've lost probably, you know, most of my social life. Like, I don't know that I have much of a social life outside of work. I kind of get my social life from yeah. work. I lost a lot of friends, but that's how I've done it is you have to choose that you just have so much time. And I've chosen for now anyways, motherhood and my business one day that will change. Um, but yeah, that's what I've done last year. My now six year old, so she was five. So keep in mind her mom, dad, auntie, uncle, um, own Ivana. And then her yeah. grandma is her like daycare. Last year, she said to me, mommy, how come nobody in our family has jobs? <laughs> how come none of you like have a job? My friend, you know, she sees her friends, parents kind of going to work and coming home. And at first I was like offended. Like, what do you mean we work so hard? But then I took a step back and I said, that is success to me. Mm -hmm. My five-year-old thinks none of us work because we're so, you know, present in their life. That is success. And I was, I will never forget that line <laughs> as long as I live that's amazing but then the, th the other thing is that like when you when you're working in an environment that you absolutely love it doesn't seem like work and uh, you know what I mean so then you know they don't see it as work because they just see that you're loving what you do you're having fun with what you do right so it, it seems more like fun to them that is amazing that's a, that's a great story uh would you say though that like over the last year and right, we're coming up into a year into the pandemic now how how has that affected your family life and things like that and how has that affected your business so you know in the beginning it was obviously very stressful because there was just so many unknowns we were breaking ground on a significant amount of real estate and we just didn't know if we were going to be shut down if we would be able to still get our supplies our materials so I kind of went into again being that I have a numbers background and I'm just a nerd deep down inside. I just built models of like worst case scenario, best case scenario, what happens at this and this and this point. And I like I suffer from anxiety and that's always how I deal with anxiety is I just kind of look at every option and then I have a plan like A B C D E mm -hmm. and that's kind of how I stay calm. So that's what I did. And I mean it didn't get that bad for us because we were deemed an essential service very right. luckily um the other thing covid did which not a lot of people especially in saskatchewan talk about is covid shone a significant spotlight on um the inequalities that exist within canada and so covid disproportionately affected our most vulnerable populations that's true and because we specialize in developing affordable housing our product became even more in demand than it, than it was before because people needed to distance, people needed to be safe in homes. And so for us, it actually really um, increased our, our opportunities, I guess, which okay. I almost kind of felt guilty throughout the year knowing that, uh, which is why we gave back in any way we could. Um, but yeah, so it's, it was crazy. My kids obviously were, we homeschooled them. My uh, grandma was actually in the hospital when COVID first hit because she uh, had recently had a mastectomy and she was battling uh, breast cancer. So she moved in and my mom moved in to help <laughs> take care of her. So there was in my Everybody house, moved in. everyone moved in. So there <laughs> was four kids under the age of seven, me and my husband, my mom, my grandma, and then seven dogs. No, six dogs. Six Good dogs. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like really, really, really crazy. Sounds like a busy house. I, I wonder what like the supper table would be oh, yeah. like. That must be crazy. And again, I was, you know, spending my days on like listening to the news and the government's updates because again, we didn't know what was mm -hmm. happening. So the first month was pretty 
hard. It was probably the hardest thing I've gone through as an entrepreneur, I would say. It's kind of scariest. Uh, but yeah, it ended up okay. 2019 to 2020, we had a 72.4% year over year growth. Wow. So through COVID, which is significant. Um, and yeah, we're super blessed and lucky that we were able to keep all of our staff employed. We didn't miss one payment on anything. We were that's able to good. really get through it well. That's, and I mean, and I think that's a great thing because I mean, a lot of the people that are working for you and working on your projects, some of them are small business owners too, right? So being able to keep going and keep them going too helps their family and helps everybody. So that that's a great thing. And now that like that we don't really know still where the future of this whole COVID thing is going. Have you have you found anything from your business side, like any efficiencies, any any lessons learned from from last year that you think you know what? Even when COVID is done, you'll be able to take forward to create more efficiencies. You know, we haven't as much as um, you would think, right? and as much as many businesses. But I think the reason for that is we are still quite a young company. And again, being all, all our kind of owners, managers are young, we already highly use technology. We use everything as cloud-based. Like we don't need to be in the office. I as our CEO already worked from home before COVID began. So we have a highly kind of non-paper, non-needing to be in the office mm -hmm. kind of cloud-based system anyways. So, uh, but I know that lots of our employees have, have uh, worked from home through COVID and enjoyed that. So maybe that's some flexibility we would keep in mind, Zoom meetings. Okay. I mean, I probably wasted too much time before COVID actually physically going to every meeting that I probably might Zoom now. Yeah. But yeah, I would say compared to a lot of companies, not as much as you would think, yeah. Yeah, like even for myself, I found that uh, everything being online, even though I missed the human interaction, I found efficiencies in everything that you normally be, be online, right? Like for example, normally I would drive to Saskatoon for a meeting, right? right. That's two, two hours there with uh, my good fast driving skills <laughs> and a couple hours back and then you're meeting, right? So now I'm finding, you know, I can spend two hours at home, do my meeting and now I still have my whole day instead of planning for the drive there, planning for the drive back. And if the meeting was in the evening, then you plan to stay in a hotel and then drive back the next day, right? So there's definitely efficiencies that a lot of people have found uh, through COVID. And I think a lot of businesses are also seeing that, hey, maybe we don't need that big square footage of an office building that we used to have anymore, right? Um, sure. You know, you mentioned something earlier about uh, giving back. I know you little bit of a philanthropist. Can you tell us about some of the some of the charity work that you do as well? Yeah, so we, uh, growing up, our family always gave back to the community. Um, I think that that's where a lot of successful people, whether it's entrepreneurs or business people, go wrong. They get successful and then they get arrogant. Uh, and I'm a believer that no matter what stage of life, business, entrepreneurship you're in, you should stay humble, kind. And if you do become blessed and you do reach a high level of success, you should thank the community that supported you to get there and you should pay it forward. And I feel like if every successful person in society thought more that way, the world would be just such a better place. Um, so we've always given back in Havana, even before we, you know, had the success we did like four years ago, we donated $80,000 to build two playgrounds, for instance, which was like probably half of our net income that year. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And so we knew that we really wanted to create long lasting community impact. Uh, so two years ago, maybe we set up um, the Avana Foundation, okay. which is a nonprofit. And we actually started building some of our real estate projects in the foundation. And so the net income that those projects are creating, we then can donate back to the community. And so it's almost like an endowment fund. And it's a way for us to ensure no matter what we're doing in Avana, if we want to slow down or not, that that community impact is going to continue to be made for years and years and years to come. Um, and so we really focus on women and children. Mm -hmm. We've given to a lot of different organizations, but as we move forward, we're looking to really um, create like a hyper focus on women and children and try to divert you know, like 98% of our funds there and make a deeper 
impact to kind of a smaller demographic. Mm -hmm. So we work uh, a lot with the YWCA, with Sophia House, and through our housing side, we have, it's called an empowerment fund. And so if we have a family, say, referred to us by Sophia House, and they've maybe fled domestic abuse and are ready to kind of move forward with their life, but maybe they can't afford the rents in one of our suites, um, we actually pull money from our fund and we supplement rent because okay. we found that offering, you know, safe, uh, attainable housing in fantastic neighborhoods in the city can completely change the trajectory of a family, of the next generation, of the kids. Oh, you know, absolutely. Yeah, going to a good school and seeing a different way of life than maybe anything they've seen before. Uh, the mom feels safe and uh, th they're inspired. And so, yeah, we've done a lot of work through through that and we plan to can really focus on continual growth within the within the uh, foundation that's amazing and i mean over the last couple of years too we've seen a big push on mental health as well and i've always said that like when you have a safe home and you know as a woman as a single woman or a woman that's dealing with some sort of a crisis and they know that their children are safe and they have a safe home that that has a really big positive effect on mental health as well so i'm really glad that you're doing that uh you know i follow you online and i see that a lot of your like a lot of your passion has to do with women empowerment what does that mean to you so I didn't even realize I was this way so much until <laughs> I, and like, I didn't even know I was a feminist up until a few years ago, honestly, my, my history and my career, like b banking used to be kind of like an old boys club. And so when I went into banking, I was a 20 or 19 year old young girl. I was supported by my managers, both female and male. I had really big dreams. Nobody thought they were crazy. And you know, I, I really was successful and I didn't feel any disadvantage because I was female. And so I was quite naive coming into the industry that I was in. I was at a huge disadvantage because I was female. And so uh, I'm kind of like a data driven person. So when I started dealing with some of these injustices, I started really looking into the statistics and mm -hmm. I realized over the past few years that Saskatchewan has deep rooted uh, sexism and racism, and we need to change that. And so being that my journey ha and what I've dealt with, I really have chosen to use my platform to fight for equality and with a focus on women. I think that leaving minorities or women out of, you know, high up positions, positions of power, leadership positions, we're basically leaving out like 70% of our talent. And if we mm -hmm. want to be the best we can be, we have to empower every single person that within true. that community. Um, and so I really hope that, you know, again, we our platform and as we get more successful, it can show, first of all, you know, the existing society that we women, even young women, even women with four little kids running around, we can be successful and powerful. And I also hope that it inspires, you know, the next generation or even women sitting on the sidelines, like wondering if they could do something like this too. I hope it inspires them to take that leap and believe in themselves and, you know, chase their dreams. Absolutely. I absolutely love that. Um, you know, with you being a numbers person, are you finding, would you say, you know, data wise, are you, are you finding that like things are slowly getting better? with equality? Well, it's not in data yet because it's almost like a real life thing. And I think what happened last year changed things a little bit. So the kind of Me Too movement going through mm -hmm. Regina and then the Black Lives Matter going through Regina, I feel like, well, not Regina, I mean the whole world yeah. really. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's caused and created some of those uncomfortable conversations that should have had been had years and years ago. And I feel like Saskatchewan's on like a cusp um, every year that goes by. And this is a, kind of a crude way of saying it, but if you look at Saskatchewan, we're probably one of the most traditional provinces in, in the country. It, why that is, I don't know if it's, you know, the deep roots of, of farming and agriculture here. There was very like structured roles for men and women. I don't know, but every year that goes by um, and, and like the old, 
older kind of like white males <laughs> that are in many of these positions of leadership and power and they retire or they get out of those positions and it makes way for the new kind of more progressive generation every year that goes by i think it's going to get better mm -hmm. every year where we have uh international immigration growing our population i think it's going to get better because we'll have a more diverse population which enriches the community um but yeah I, I think it's slowly getting better i'm a very impatient person i like things to happen really quick yeah. so for me it's not quite <laughs> as fast as i would like to see sandra masters becoming our first female mayor was a huge step for for the last Absolutely. year too. so yeah. yeah i would say it's getting better i don't think it's in the numbers yet we still you know at the end of the day i mean we still have the highest rates of uh, domestic abuse against women across the country and there's those kind of we do in Saskatchewan mm -hmm. wow I did not know that and we have you know like record high uh, child apprehension rates our female uh, incarceration is or no our female uh, prisons are at like 105 percent capacity for for women so like those statistics tell you that the kind of basic needs for women are not being met as well as they are in other provinces or we wouldn't have those stats. So I think there's definitely work to be done, but I would say in, you know, the, yeah, like the leadership entrepreneurial space, things like that, it is getting a little bit better. Well, and I, th and I think like entrepreneurs and people in leadership position are definitely well equipped to lead the charge in this too. So, and I think they should be leading the charge in it. So I definitely appreciate that when I see you speak out and I see your post, I see that you are leading the charge. You are encouraging other people to, to pay attention to some of these issues that you've mentioned. So that is a very, very great thing. Uh, before we uh, kind of uh, bring our conversation to an end here, I want to ask you this. There's, there's so many people out there that it would be their goal to start their own businesses and get into entrepreneurship. What would be some of the tips that you can offer to some of those people? What are some of the tips? Even if you can do your top five tip. Okay. We'll call it Jane's top five tips. So I would say the number one thing and would be create a plan, like a real plan with objectives, uh, realistic with some forecasts. I, I meet people often who kind of have an idea and they think they might want to start a business, but they have no plan. So if you have no plan, it's very hard to be successful. When I decided I wanted to start Avana, I actually took an eight hour course on, online on writing a business plan and I wrote it. And that's how I gained access to what I needed to kind of start the business. I would say that um, to, excuse me, to, I would say you need the right people around you. Um, entrepreneurship is incredibly difficult yeah. growing and scaling a business is incredibly difficult and you need a strong group of people to to lean on and so for me i'm so lucky that i got to do you know i get to have this journey with my family i have my husband my brother my sister-in-law all four of us there was times within the last seven years one of us wanted to quit and the other three of us were there you know each other up to support yeah and so you need there are going to be really hard times and so having people that you trust who aren't going to be jealous of you or envious or any of that kind of stuff you need to have in your corner um three i would say you again you have to believe in yourself if you don't believe in yourself nobody else is going to and once you believe in yourself and you have internal confidence so many things become easier so when there's like the haters you don't even care you yeah. don't even, you know, it's almost like a compliment that people are using up their time talking about you because, you know, you're got so much going on. So I just think that internal confidence and belief um, and not listening to the haters because there definitely will be them once you get success. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just think, you know, even as you grow in your business, no matter what journey you're on, having goals, having a plan, working hard and holding yourself accountable are so important investing back in your business troy and i like my husband and i did not take a paycheck from avana for the first like two or three years we didn't take a cent out of it even now like we invest 98 percent of our profits back into the business to grow it each year um i find like so often people kind of find some success and then 
you know, they start buying like the really expensive cars or this or that, and these depreciating assets that aren't going to mm-hmm. serve you if you're trying to scale a business. So just staying focused, making prudent decisions and yeah. um, yeah, but I just think overall, you know, looking, looking at your situation and making it better each year, giving back to the community, I think is super important too, especially with this kind of day and age, like consumers want more authentic brands. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, just, and hard, hard work. I mean, I had no idea that this would be this much work. I got my first six figure a year job when I was like 22. And I thought that was hard work. Like that was nothing compared to this. And, uh, but once you get there, it's just so like liberating and inspiring and exciting and fulfilling. It's so worth it, but it is a lot of work. Perfect. So you have to have a plan. Yes. Have a plan. You got to believe yourself. Yes. Bring the right people around you. Invest back in your business and be prepared to work hard. Yeah. Perfect. We're going to call that Jen's five tips to entrepreneurship. (laughs) Thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed our conversation. I know you've got a lot going on, so I don't want to keep you too long. But once again, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take care. Bye. Conversation with Tim Oditucci. Let's talk about business and lifestyle.